Stanford University. Hey, so this is uh, lecture 11 uh, in CS 193G. G. Um, and today we have another guest speaker. Today we have Mike Shepano from the research group at NVIDIA. And he was one of the principal architects behind uh, Fermi, uh, which is the newest generation uh, GPU. And uh, previously to that, he got his PhD from Berkeley. Oh, no. <laughs> nice. And uh, then worked at Motorola, uh, HAL Computers, um, Cyrix, back to HAL, AMD, and then on to NVIDIA. So he's basically seen a lot of CPU architecture and kind of been part of the evolution of GPUs. And today he's going to be talking to us about the Fermi architecture and you know what it is. All right, Mike, thank take you. it away. So, well, thanks. Well, thanks a lot. Well, thanks for having me here today. Actually, both of you guys too. So. Um, I'm here to talk about Fermi, and Fermi was a long time in development. I think I started, I was kind of on the early light bulb stage, you know, at the very, very beginning of it. I think it was like around, I don't know, 2005 is when that was. So it took a long time to develop. Very complicated GPU as we'll go through it. And part of the complexity was that it's dual natured. So it's, it's not only just a, you know, graphics engine, it's also a compute engine. And we specifically designed it to be a really good compute engine, as well as graphic engine. It's so an overview of the product. So here's a picture. This is a, a dia photo in color. Color bit was added. Uh, you can kind of see, make out different parts of it. And I put a block, uh, you know, rough block diagram to the right of that. And so what you're looking at here, these are like what we call TPCs. You can see the, the outline of them. They're a total of 16 of them in the chip. And each TPC, you've been look, learning probably about the SM, the shader processors, contains one of those SMs. You can kind of see the outline of it there on the die. And in block diagram form, it's shown this way. These are all the different TPCs, the 16 of them. And in the middle of the chip, the core, we have a lot of fixed function logic, but also we have the central crossbar, which is pretty apparent uh, in the design. What's TPC? TPC, oh, I'm sorry. It's a texture processor cluster. So if you look at the evolution of GPUs within uh, NVIDIA, at least, we've, I actually started NVIDIA working on G80 uh, a while ago. And that chip was you know, about 680 million transistors. You can see it's been popping up, and Fermi is 3 billion transistors. And the performance is roughly scaled. You know, we had, if you look at single precision floating point operations, 128 mats per clock, about 4x on Fermi. And it's a little over 4x the area. Um, we have 4x of transistor count, but notice also the double precision. We added that to the design as well. That explains part of the, the bump that's occurring with some other logic. Uh, another notice, a really noticeable thing that we added in Fermi, and I'm going to go a lot more into that, is caching hierarchy, which wasn't present in uh, previous generations. Caches are important to graphics, but not anywhere near how they are for compute. So memory hierarchy. In, in graphics workloads, we basically, every time we draw a screen, we completely start over from scratch. So if you're rendering at 60 frames a second, it's kind of flush everything you did before, start over again, redraw the frame, present it to the screen, flush again. And so because the data sets are so large, we really couldn't afford in graphics chips before that to keep all of the, the content on chip. There's no way you could build a cache big enough. Like, for example, if you have a four gigabyte frame buffer, we're not going to build a four gigabyte cache to sort of store things on chip between frames. So we're really bringing it all on board. All the, all the working set that comes with graphics is, has to be brought back on board every single frame, 60 times or whatever per second. And so we really design around that. Now, in computing generations, it makes a lot more sense than actually the way we did Fermi. We try to make use of the caching structure in Fermi for graphics as well. I'll go a little bit into that. Sure. On the previous slide, um, year of introduction, technology node, die size? Uh, don't remember if I, off the top of my head, the exact number. Um, I think in uh, 45 nanometer, it's like 480. 
something like that. So what, what some of the goals when we started the, you know, Fermi, we wanted to expand the sweet spot of the GPU, you know, caching, concurrent kernels. These are our compute applicate, you know, compute centric views. And certainly bring the applications much easier to, to uh, use GPUs for general purpose computing applications. So C++, Visual Studio's integration, ECC, which, you know, in graphics, if you take an error on a frame, well, you're gonna draw it again 60 of a second later might show up as a little blip on the screen, that's the end of it. Obviously for computing applications, that's not really good, right? If you have a data error, people don't like that. So we have to, we had to add ECC for a lot of our customers there just to, to protect the data that, that was not a requirement in the past. Mike, can you just tell them what ECC is and does? Oh, I'm sorry. ECC is error, correct, error um, detection and correction. So if you, we have these large memory structures, the register files, the, the caches, um, memory itself, and you know, cosmic rays basically can hit bit cells and cause them to flip. So if we don't protect that, you'll silently get a bit flip, you won't know about it, and it's an error. So, so what we did is, we, the way ACC works, and just a really brief side on that is, you have data and we add a little bit of redundancy. So for example, if you want to store 64 bits, what we'll really do is we'll store 72. And we'll redundantly encode some of the data so that, in other words, if you want to store a 64 bit number, you need you know, two to the 64th different states for that. But if you have a 72 bit number, there's two to the 72 states. So it's 256 more numbers representable with that 8 bit additional field than there is with the 64 bit field. And we use that basically to keep we say all legal representations of numbers, we keep them far apart. And that way, if there's a slight error, we can shift back to the, rec the correct legal representation, if you want to think of it numerically. It's called Hamming distance. So in other words, you have one point here and another point here. You get a small perturbation off center, so to speak. As long as it doesn't go to the point where it's ambiguous, right? we can tell where the number should have been, right? and then we can correct toward it. Other areas of Fermi that we really concentrated on is, you know, certainly improve peak performance. And I think most of chip designers, and us included, when we design chips, we you know target. We try and keep up with Moore's law, which is uh, Gordon Moore, you know, roughly doubling every uh, one, every two years, couple years, the performance of the chip. So we start off a new design. We say, well, whatever it does now, it better do. You know, if it's going to be three years later, it better do four x as much in terms of performance. So. That was, a, that was a, a very big uh, focus item. And of course, we are always looking for improved efficiency. And so another big design goal we had when we started it was do the same thing you used to do, but better. Meaning, you know, if you measured, if we, we can take a previous generation process, say we're at 65 nanometer, we know how that shrinks to 45 nanometer. And it's roughly, you know, figure you double the transistor count for every process step. So we know what we should be getting from a, we can compare two different implementations from one process to another. And we say, well, even if we, if we were to take the old product and downscale it to the new process, it'd be so big. And then the question is, the new product, we'd like it smaller to do the same thing. That's improved efficiency. Certainly broader applicability, which means, you know, why you guys are here programming the GPU, that's broader applicability. You know, 10 years ago, the only thing they did with GPU is draw pictures. So we're, we're certainly focused on trying to make it easier to use as a general purpose computer. And part of that was also integrating that with modern software. There are two initial products that are Fermi based and I'm shown here on the, and you know, there's GTX 480 and the 470. They differ in the number of computing cores that are on chip. I'll go a little bit more detail about that later. Uh, certainly the, See other feature differences, the power is certainly different, the clock rates, the amount of memory that are there. But those are the two fundamental products. Um, two big things we added to Fermi. I'll go through a little bit. Part of it's for games. And so we had a huge focus on tessellation. And you can see between these two images here, one is kind of flat. There's not much detail, geometric detail in it. 
And certainly if you go to something like a movie, there's a tremendous amount of geometric detail in some of these pictures. So what is tessellation? Well, I can show it here with these two pictures. So when we, we represent underneath in the uh, images in terms of tri triangles, you can see the triangles up there in that mountain. You can see the shape of the mountain. The triangles in the background of the sky that we're rendering against. When we tessellate, we actually basically subdivide those triangles into lots of little small triangles. And we, add, we basically add geometric detail to the, you know, what used to be flat, you see some of the peaks that are around here, turn into rough surfaces. And that shows up with what you can see in here in the detail. So you can see in the upper screen here how that, that little ridge line is kind of flat, and it certainly has a tremendous amount more, more detail down on the bottom picture. And that's we can do display, what they call displacement maps. So you can kind of picture the original fabric is kind of, you know, it's like you starched it a lot. There's not much freedom of movement. And if we allow, if we crumple up the fabric a little bit more, right, to represent what the mount looks like, we can get a lot more geometric detail at, at the lower level. So what can you do with it? Um, as an example, we can render water in really fine detail. Uh, this picture up here, when it's running, I wish I had the demo, but it's doing about one and a half billion triangles per second. Uh, rendered by the GPU. And, you know, again, we can really finely simulate hair. Um, and, you know, every one of those strands of hair represented a line that we tessellated um, to represent the waviness of it. And, you know, there's a tremendous number of hairs in there, 18,000 lines. Every one of them is computed. And then we built what they call billboarding to give it thickness. And this will all simulate with physics in there as well. So, you know, if the head moves around, we simulate the mass. And so I'll give you a really good graphical demonstration difference of, of what you can do with tessellation versus not. You know, you can see we have, a, there's a uni engine here, and you can see two different images from that without tessellation. This is tessellation is off. And if I pop it on, you can see what happens with, with the image, right? Everything, you can see the details here. There's a lot of, if you go back one slide, you look at the shadows, because there's no, in this particular case, the image is actually flat underneath it. So there's no, the lighting source, there's really no shadowing. The shadowing that you, he, you see here is simulated in the texture that we have. But when we turn on tessellation, we can actually do shadows. You can see where the rock shadowing things. Same thing, you look at the tile on top. The tiles are self-shadowed, meaning that's why there's darkness behind them. So they really are simulating with, te with geometry in the tessellation case, there was no geometry in the non-tessellated case. Uh, the other big focus area, like I said, is just much bigger, much better compute. Um, programmability, we had a C++. We only had C before. Uh, exceptions and debug support. This is, again, to make it easier for programmers to use. Uh, performance, we focused a lot on it. We added dual-issue SMs compared to G80, which is single-issue SMs. Issue rate refers to how fast the instructions can be executed by the processor. We doubled it. Uh, we added a cache, you know, much larger shared memory, much, much better double precision floating point at DP math, and better atomics and reliability. Again, you can see the differences kind of highlighted here in this chart. You know, we had, you can see there's, there was no level one cache in previous generations. We have that now in Fermi. The uh, memory is greatly expanded and there's a massive improvement in double precision performance. So going on to the SM, which is the, the main part of it, which does all the execution. Uh, you, some of the objectives we had for it was, first off, DX11 support. Uh, DX11 is DirectX11 for Microsoft. It's what now has tessellation in it. It's a Win7 feature. If you buy Win7, you get you DX11. Uh, another thing we look for is optimizing for GPU computing, which required us to add a new instruction set architecture, the ISA. So we completely changed over the instruction set of the processor as compared to the previous generation to support some of the new programming features. And <coughs> in terms of execution rates, these were, you can see this chart down here. FP32 and FP64 are the, are the floating point 32-bit, 64-bit math rates that we can support. Then there's integer operation rates, special function unit operation rates. Uh, you guys are probably not going to be interested in SFU. It's, it's really a graphics feature, um, IPA. 
We also have uh, logarithmic other functions to go about the same speed that are like logs, sines, cosines, etc. And then load store operations, which are executing out of the cache. The, the uh, general picture, when I mentioned before TPC, this is really what's in a TPC, texture processing cluster. And it's referred to a TPC because there's, there's a processor and there's obviously texture units for graphics. They form a cluster. And down here at the bottom is what they call the polymorph engine. That's where we do all that test. There's a lot of fixed function hardware there to do help with uh, texturing, and uh, not texturing, tessellation, the way I just showed you previous slides there. So what's a CUDA core? Uh, CUDA core is this highlighted part that I showed up here. It's really um, a conceptually a floating point unit and an energy unit side by side that are fed by um, a register file and some logic to put source operands in and take destination results out. So for example, when you say, and for us, when you say floating point multiply, we have to go read some registers, collect the operands together, feed them at the execution units. When the execution units are done, we have to sort of decollect, you know, redistribute the results and write them back to the register file. And that's what's shown up here in this, in this diagram. So you have a dispatch port, which is saying, I really want to execute it. And then you have a collection operation, which is go read the register file, collect the sources up that you need to do the multiply, and then feed it downward. And you get your choice, integer floating point. That core is replicated, as you can see there, 32x, Just cookie cutter. Uh, a big change we added for firm, and this is a programmability feature, is you know, full IEEE support. And it's the modern uh, 754, 2008. Which means we have both 32 and 64 bit double precision, if you're familiar with the mathematics precision of IEEE floating point. It's completely supported there, including denormals. Did, no. Um, so denormal, floating point, is everybody here familiar with floating point? Formats, right? So you have sine, exponent, mantissa, right? And normally, if you start, if you underflow, for example, as you go toward negative infinity, right? In, in, or sorry, not negative. As you go toward one over infinity, very, very small numbers, right? You can get to the point where you can't make the exponent any smaller. Right? And so what older machines used to do is just flush the mantissa to zero, and you'd get zero. And with D-norms or gradual underflow, we start shifting the mantissa to the right gradually. You get gradual underflow, and that eliminates that precision loss as you get to very, very small numbers. Just a little bit extra precision. It's unfortunately very hard to build. And so uh, it's a, it, sounds great, it sounds great as a concept, but it's, it adds a lot of hardware, and we, you know, so we support it. A lot of other, I've worked on CPUs before where we said, you know, well, we'll do the regular stuff at high speed, but then when you get a denorm, we'll trap it and send it off to software to, so, to figure out, which means that if you ever have denorm, either flush to zero or trap, that was your options. So putting this in as, you know, in hardware at full speed was a little bit of doing. On the instruction set architecture, the ISO that I talked about before, um, C++, there's a lot of things in C++ that are hard for um, processors. And so virtual functions, um, new delete with the exceptions that can occur, um, same thing with try catch, they're, they're difficult. So we had to put support for that. I'm gonna, I have a slide on uniform load store addressing that I'll go through in a little bit, um, talking about that. We have much larger addresses now, so instead of where previous processors only supported 32-bit addresses. We now have full, you know, compared to CPUs, we sort of caught up with what CPU can do, but for a graphics engine, which is a doing. And then it was optimized for, you know, we did look carefully at CUDA, OpenCL, and Direct Compute, and made sure that we supported that, you know, completely supported it, including some of the native surface-based stuff, which I don't think I'll go into. So on addressing, uh, as you guys have been aware, you've been, you've been taught now, uh, there's lots of different address spaces within a GPU. 
And so, because we're running lots and lots of threads in parallel, first off, every thread has its own private memory. And that can be used either as a per thread private stack or per thread private local storage, doesn't make much difference. But you can have per thread views of memory. In addition to that, groups of threads and thread blocks can share memory. So if you're you are familiar with shared memory now, another way of dealing with memory is to have a shared view. So in other words, you have private views per thread, then you have a shared view that shared among a block of, of threads. And finally, there is main memory, which is visible to everybody. So you have a thread block here and another thread block here. Every memory, every um, thread running in those different blocks has the same view of global memory. So three different views of, diff of memory, private, shared, and global. And in previous processors, the non-unified, you'd really have, if you had pointers, you had to kind of know what you're pointing at. In other words, if you wanted to talk to local, you had to set up a pointer to local, and it could only talk to local memory. If you wanted a shared memory pointer, you'd have to do a shared memory, a different type of pointer. And finally, there was global, which is a third type. And what we try to do now in Fermi is have a unified address space, which means that we take this big global address space, and we say we, we chop it out so to any one thread, we say this range of addresses looks like private to you. So, for example, if I said this local memory, the private memory, was at location 1,000, one thread with an address of 1,000 would see, some, you know, might see a number five. Another thread would see the number six, because they're private. So in other words, every thread sees a different version of local, even though the addresses are the same. Whereas you can have two threads, both say address 1000, they see different data. With shared, threads in the same thread block with address 1000 would see the same data. Right? But if I go between two different thread blocks, they could see different data. Only when you go outside of these two regions, when you say over here, say for address 1 million, then every thread, when it says 1 million, will see the same thing. And so what, we, what this means to, inside the hardware we, we built, we actually have to have thread-specific mappings for how you translate one address to what goes into, the, into memory. There was because what one, one address to one thread is not the same in a necessarily in another thread. The benefit to, to application programmers is you can have libraries now that are agnostic as to what type of memory they're referring to. So for example, if I have like a print routine, and I have a data structure, you can say print, pass the data structure, and it doesn't really matter what memory space it goes to. I can have a pointer to generic memory. In other words, if I want to print local, pass a pointer to local. If I want to print shared, pass a pointer to shared. If I want to print global, pass a pointer. The subroutine itself doesn't have to know what type of pointer it is. In the other version, I'd have to have three different types of print subroutines. I'd have to have print underscore local, print underscore shared, print underscore global, because the memory, the pointer type mattered. In other words, you can't use a local pointer in global context. The software would know what type, had to know it. Yes. So the last thing that we, we had a lot of people complaining about previous generations is atomic rates. So we put a lot of focus on how fast can we do atomic operations. So we, we did spend a lot of time on, and we'll probably continue to improve this, which is how fast can you do atomics? Read, modify, writes. So what is an atomic? If You've discussed it? Okay. So this says here we increased atomic performance about 5 to 20x depending on cases. I think you were saying the other day you did a test and it, yeah. it was noticeably faster for me. Can you elaborate on how you guys did that? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll err on the top secret side. <laughs> and I, we are talking about ECC. I, I'm not going to go too much more into this. It's all, all structures, register file, L1 cache, L2 cache. And the main memory DRAM is protected now by ECC and GF100.
Okay, so operationally, what's going on inside an SM? Uh, in Fermi, you can picture previous generations just delete one of the warp scheduled instruction dispatch units. So, like G80, you're probably programming now. GT200 even. You just delete one of those warp scheduler dis, um, instruction dispatch units. It, uh, there's only a single one in GT200, that, which you're programming at now. So Fermi, we have two of them, so we can actually issue two, inst two completely different instructions per clock um, simultaneously. And once you've issued that, they go down to a set of cores that are shared. In other words, there's a common resource. All the execution units are shared by the two different streams of instructions. And that means if, you know, depending on if one stream has a certain workload balance, another stream has a different workload balance, we don't starve units because they're incompatible. So, for example, if you only have one dispatcher, if you've if you got nothing but floating point multiplies, well, the floating point multiply units are happy, but then this unit is sitting idle. You're not doing loads. So, our, our intent with increasing the issue rate and issue rate tends to be the most precious resource that at least I've seen so far in GPUs, right? You increase the likelihood of being able to utilize all those execution units that we're putting there. And these execution units are what determines your performance. So an example of how dish dual issue can work, um, what it's showing here is we actually break up all the warps into even and odd in Fermi. There's 24 even warps, 24 odd warps, maximum. And so the evens get their own dispatcher, their odds get their own dispatcher. So they're completely independent. It's kind of like two brains split down the middle. And all the scheduling that occurs here is completely independent, like I said. So you know, we can basically do different instructions, different warps, and the same thing, even and odd split between the two sides. They're completely independent. And in general, they don't fight each other. There are certain exceptions. We only have a single load unit, for example. So we can't issue two loads at the same time from both sides. So we have to ping pong back and forth for loads. But for like multiplies and adds and all that, they just go completely independent. Uh, caches. So trying to highlight the difference between previous. So GT200 and Fermi, the, the two different chips. So. In the previous designs, you had the processor, you had a register file, hierarchy, and wham, you're out to memory. So if you, anytime you, if it couldn't be fit in the register file, you would basically, there was a shared memory, it's off to the side there as I'm showing there. Your choices are either I'm gonna access data out of shared, excuse me, data out of the register file, or memory. And what we wanted to do is, you know, basically we switched, completely switched that around we went to a unified cache shared memory, so now everything is kind of going through one path. Um, and the intent there was to not have two different ways of doing the same thing. And in addition to that, you can also cache local data, just like you would on a regular CPU. You can cache data locally to the, to the GP, to the processor, without having to talk to a long distance cache or memory. Uh, the caches themselves, are, they're configurable. You can switch back and forth between having 16K of cache and 48K of shared, or flip it around, go 48K of cache, 16K of shared, depending on your application. We also tried very hard to use this in graphics, and this is showing, the graphics pipeline is kind of shown here, up here at the top. So we have vertex fetch, vertices, in case you want to know, the if you have a triangle, it's the three corners of the triangle are a vertex. And every vertex has attributes, and the attributes, a very common one is position. Where in three-dimensional space is an attribute, is the, is the triangle vertex. So if I were, you know, quickly, if I were to let me create a triangle here. First while. So here's a triangle, sort of. <laughs> You know, one vertex, another vertex, another vertex. As I rotate that triangle around space, right, the position of the three corners changes. So an a, a vertex attribute is where, is the, where are the vertices. So you can picture this is just a triangle, right? I could, have a I could actually have an image which is, you know, a million or several million triangles on the screen. And each one of them would have those position attributes. So you can have position, color, uh, 
A lot of algorithms use normal, you know, so where, you know, if I have like a surface, where's the surface normal? Um, they represent different things for different reasons. But those are all just geometrical properties of the vertices. And that's what's going on at the front end of the pipe. And so we then would do, go through vertex shader, which is really a transform process. The very the earliest graphics had you know they call it flat shading, which is you know there'd be a single color associated with one of the vertices, and they just paint the whole triangle that color. And then there's garage shading, which would say, well, I'm going to have the three vertices three different colors, and I'll interpolate into the you know I'll use barycentric coordinates, which is I'll just interpolate to the middle of the triangle, you know wherever I am in the triangle, I'll create an interpolated version of the you know kind of a mix of the three colors, so it's kind of a smooth transition. And you go further than that, you know, it's more complicated texture mapping, which is like a map, a, a bitmap effectively onto the triangle. Um, and so there's kind of a positional thing, which is, you know, and, you know, you can do cool things with that, you know, just besides playing games that you do now. You know, for example, we can say, take a sphere, you can tessellate the sphere, which means represent its surface by lots of little tiny triangles, right? And then I can smoothly map a bitmap onto that surface. And that bitmap could, in fact, be coming from, uh, you know, a uh, MPEG-4 decoder. So, for example, you can say, take an MPEG-4 decoder, decode a video stream, write the video stream frame by frame into memory, then texture map that memory onto the sphere and spin the sphere. Now you could picture, I don't know why you do this, but you could picture <laughs> watching the news while it's spinning, right? It doesn't make much difference. To the GPU, texture is a texture. It doesn't really care where it comes from. So... That's where color would come in. Um, there are lots of different ways of doing coloring. Uh, it'd be a different cor probably courses. I think there are here anyway, so um, to go through that. But so, anyways, what vertex shading is doing is transform, converting to screen space. I'm not going to go through with the others, but what we try to do. The point of this slide is to say we try to use the caches to store the data that goes between these stages. We try and keep the data local to the processor. And that way, avoid using the crossbar, the main interconnect, to actually talk to memory. So we consciously designed in use of the caching heart to help us out. Um, I didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> we consciously try to design in the use of the caches and doing graphics as much as possible. And it's still ongoing. How we're, we're trying more and more in the future to make better use of caches. So the last part of this talk and I'm going to go into is how do you tune for performance for the GPU? And it'll get a little theoretical here, but um, so in hard, you know, key concepts in computing. So we have hardware thread management. So unlike software, you know, like CPUs, where you have to do all the heavy lifting in software, either yourself or via libraries, to create threads, we have fixed function hardware to, ma to create and manage threads. So very, very high speed. So for example, um, we can create threads as fast per SM as fast as 32 threads per clock. So our clock rate, you know, near 700 megahertz. So you do the math, right? 700 times 32 times 16. So a very horrific thread rate. In other words, we can create threads at a blinding speed. So that makes them really cheap for you. So don't be shy using threads. You want, to do, you want to have a thread, I'll talk a little bit more later, but you want a thread, create them. They're nearly free. Uh, we have hardware thread switching, which means that if a thread blocks in something, like say you have a thread to a load, we will virtually instantaneously switch to another thread while it's blocked. And all that scheduling is done in hardware. Unlike a, a CPU operating system, like when you run Windows, like what this thing is running right now, Every time something blocks, you're going to go through the kernel and out back, and it's going to be you know thousands of instructions to figure out what to run next. We don't do that. You know, for us, it's the next cycle. 700 megahertz. So we have this thing called SIMT execution model, and SIMT stands for single instruction multi-threaded, which is really doing things in parallel. Saying we we fetch, and I'm going to go through a little bit more later about that. I could show you maybe better wait for the slide. We have parallel execution at the data level, sequential execution at the instruction level. Multiple memory scopes, we talked about the unified address space. Um, 
So I'm gonna, and we have, you can use threads to hide memory latency. I'll talk about that. And finally, really good core screen synchronization. Yeah, all of you guys know what that was, sync threads. Good at programming. And sync threads is directly mapped to hardware. It's done in hardware. So I'm going to introduce something called limiter theory. I'll talk about that in the next slide. But before we're going into what limiter theory is, it, it's good to see what a conceptual view of how the shader processor works, the SM. And the shader processor starts off with we have up to 48 warps. Every warp has a program counter, which is this is pointing to the next instruction that warp should execute. So there are 48 individual program counters, every one saying which one to execute next. We select one, and then we go fetch instructions, and we try to fill these queues of instruction buffers. So in effect, what we're doing is we're saying, for the instruction pointed to by this program counter, go fetch it and put it into that queue. In other words, when you guys create, you, you might say in your program, you know, A plus B, C equals A plus B. That maps to an instruction, right? There'll be a program counter pointing at that instruction. We have to go to memory to fetch the instruction, bring it in, decode it, and prepare it for execution. So when the program, all this hardware you're showing here from the instruction cache is basically given the program counter points at some instruction, go fetch it and put it in here. Prepare it for execution. Once we do that, remember I talked about how every single cycle we can choose a new warp to execute. We have hardware thread scheduling. Right? So this scheduler unit can pick between any of the queues that have instructions in it and say, go. So if this queue is empty, there's another queue that's full, we'll pick the full queue. We're not going to wait. And finally, this whole side of it that I talked about, I said single instruction, this is done one at a time. So we're sharing hardware. We're saying, even if you have a warp, which is 32 threads, we're not going to fetch 32 times for that warp. We're only going to fetch once because the program data is kind of invariant. In other words, the instruction is invariant across the different threads. If 32 threads are running in parallel and they all point at the same instruction, I don't have to fetch 32 different copies of the instruction for that, for each one per thread. All the threads are going to execute the same thing, so I only have to fetch it once, decode it once, and only when I get to this boundary here do I have to switch into this parallel mode. So everything on this side here is sequential, Everything on this side is now multi-threaded parallel. And here is where I do everything, and I kind of try to highlight it in 3D to, to show the difference between sequential and parallel. Everything here is going on in parallel. So when you say warp, we're actually executing warp wide, 32 threads at a time. So what is lim how do you predict the performance of how well that thing's going to do? So we, we have the same problem trying to figure out that question when we started off doing this project. We had different performance models in the past. We said we wanted to know, given some program, you know, and we started looking at different compute programs and different graphics programs, how fast will it go without actually having to build it? So we created this theory we call limiter theory internally to predict the SM performance. And you can, it's based on the idea of supply and demand. And I'll go into that a little bit. So there are three types of limits to performance. There's what I call bandwidth limiters. They're per thread block space limiters and per thread space limiters. And the limit to performance first order can be modeled as the, the most constraining limit is what dictates the performance of the processor. So a little bit more in bandwidth limiters. This might help explain this. So let's say you've coded a uh, CUDA application you have a thread block. Right, and you want to know how fast can I execute one thread block. So let's say your thread block takes, you know, very simply a matrix multiply of a tile, you know, say a, a 16 by 16 tile of, of numbers. You say, I want to know how fast can, that, can I push that thread block through the machine? In other words, what, at what rate can I execute it at? And you can represent rates by what I showed at the top there, lambda TB. That's the rate at which thread blocks are moving through the machine measured in thread blocks per, per second, or thread blocks per clock, or whatever your favorite you know, you know, metric is. But it's a rate, like velocity. What's the velocity of thread blocks for the machine? So what I really like to know as a, as a programmer is, how fast can I push these thread blocks through the machine? 
the rate. Because if I know how many I have to execute, right, rate, uh, you know, number divided by rate equals time. So every thread block is going to be composed of some distribution of operations. They could be floating point, you know, adds, floating point multiplies, floating point subtracts, loads, stores. There's a, you can look at your program and say you can count up. Just doing accounting. This program, you know, if I do one thread, it's going to take so many of these, each type of operation to do that program. And that off creates kind of a demand, which is saying, if I want to push through threads at a certain rate, let's, I'm going to put a number to it instead of saying lambda TV all the time. I'll say, I want to do one thread block every 10 clocks, just, just to you know, pick some number. Right? If, if I want to do one thread block every 10 clocks, and a thread, every thread, let's say a thread block equals 100 threads, well, that means that every... 10 clocks, I have to complete 100 threads, or another way of saying it, 10 threads per clock. Right? That's how fast I have to go. Well, if a, if a thread, if it, when you execute a thread, if a thread has 50 instructions in it, and I have to complete them at 10 per clock, I have to execute 500 instructions per clock. Straightforward math. Right? So the whole machine right now, remember I talked about how every SM is dual issue? That refers to warps. So dual issue warps, a warp is 32 threads. Dual issue means 64 threads times 2 per clock. I can do 64 instructions per clock per SM. And Fermi GF100 has 16 of them in its peak configuration. Right? So you get 16 times 64, or in other words, um, you get a full 1,000 instructions per clock across the machine. That's how fast, that's the, as fast as it'll go. Right? So we just did this calculation before. We said, well, if I want to get, if I want to get 10 threads per clock times 50 instructions each, that's 500 instructions per clock. Well, I have 1,000, so it should be doable. Right? I only need 500. And the throughput I'm asking for is, is asking for 500, half of it. So there's nothing from an issue rate limitation that would say you're going you're gonna to slow down. But there could be other things that would cause you to slow down. So what the limiter theory talks about is saying, well, for a particular type of operation, for example, flowing point add, like I show in this, pro this, here you have a thread block, admittedly very, very simple, right? Compute some index and then do a, do a vector addition in effect, right? So what does that consist of? It consists of one flowing point add, which is right there, okay? An integer add, which is here, an integer multiply, right? And then you have two loads, floating point load here, floating point load here, the floating point add, then a floating point store. Right? So there's the tally, the instruction count tally for that, for that little kernel. This is per thread, right? I'm going to, when we're doing a launch, a thread block launch there, every single thread is going to do that sequence. So in this particular case, I have six instructions to execute. So, you know, I, I've kind of, I can compute here what the load will be put on the machine for a certain rate. I only have a certain supply. So remember how we talked about the SM? We said that in this machine right now in Fermi GF100, across 16 SMs, I can do 512 floating point math operations per clock. That's the limit. So that's your supply. So I can't do 600 floating point operations per clock. I can only do 512. Period. I can do less. I can make it worse. I can say you only do one floating point per clock. That's fine. But you can't do any more than 512. It's a finite upper bound on how fast you can go for floating point ads or any floating point operation. So we're finally getting down here to those limit equation. Let me explain what that limit equation is. So as is shown here, this equation kind of says here that Demand has to always be less than supply, or equal to. Saying, for example, op means like you can say floating point add. Well, I can't do floating point adds faster than 512 per clock. So that's that rate, 512. I can look at my program and I can say the throughput of the thread block times the number of threads in the thread block times the number of floating point adds I have in that per thread in the program. 
other words, in this particular one, I only have one. So if we apply the limiter equation here, I'd say, for example, if I launch here a block, which is 128 threads, right, S equals 128, N op, or N sub add equals 1, pretty easy, right? So I'd have 128 and 1, okay? And that's would be these two values. And I say, well, this value here is 512, right? So I have one equation, one unknown, it's easy to solve. And that brings you to the second side where I invert it. So all I did is just divide through S and op on both sides, and you end up with a constraint, which says here the throughput of the thread block for this particular op is limited to the bandwidth you have available for that op divided by the demand. Does that make sense? So you have supply and demand. So we build hardware, we, we have a certain supply, you know, we, you pay for it, how many different execution units of a certain type we have, and that, those execution units give you a certain capacity to execute things, a certain rate. I can't go faster than this rate. So if I know the rate limit and I know what the demand for that rate is, I can compute a limit on the throughput. And so what limiter theory is doing is saying I can compute that. You know, if I have adder units or load units or special function units to do logarithmic operations, or multiply units, every type of unit, there's a certain bandwidth available. I can calculate the limit equation for every single type of limit. Whichever one is smaller, I'm not going to go faster than that. I can go slower than that, but I'm not going to go faster than that. So part of your challenge as a programmer is to say, is to understand the hardware constraints a little bit, understand what's in that piece of hardware, and tune your software to kind of match, so everything is kind of critical. What we refer to as a critical limiter is, is the limiter that most limits performance. It's the smallest rate. And what you really would like in a program, if you're making really good use of our hardware, is every limiter is critical. Because then you're not wasting resources, right? If you have one limiter that's down here and you have another limiter that's over here, there's a whole bunch of hardware here that's not being used. And so, you know, some of the programmers we had, you know, back at NVIDIA, when they look at different kernels, they'll go look at that. They'll say, you know, what's the bandwidth utilization that I see for every unit type? And they'll adjust the algorithm to, maxima to sort of spread the load so everything is kind of uniformly used. Just like there are rate limiters, there's also space limiters. And we don't have infinite space on the chip. So there's finite limits on warp count. Every SM has max of 48. You get less than that, but it's not going to get more. So we can fit at most 48 warps in the machine at one time. We have limits on the register file space. Uh, that happens to be, you can think of it per thread, 1,000 registers per thread, per thread lane, meaning across all 48 warps for a particular thread number, no more than 1,000 registers for GF100. So for example, with 48, you do the math. 1,024 divided by 48, it's a little bit more than 21 registers per thread. In other words, if, you, if you're going to have 48 warps in the machine, we're not going to give you more than 21 registers per thread. If, if the compiler is saying, I want 64 registers per thread, we can't have more than 16 warps in the machine, because that's a limit. And finally, there's a limit on shared memory. I mentioned there's either 16K or 48K, depending on you configure it. Not going to have more. So there's a space limit. So these space resources we talked about, they're allocated when you launch a thread block. When you, when you say create the thread block of 128 threads, we allocate whatever you need. If you say I want 16 registers per thread, we will allocate 16 registers per thread for however big the thread block is. And those registers will stay allocated as long as the thread block's alive. When the thread block completes, we'll deallocate them. And the consumption is computed with Little's law, which I'm going to show over here. So Little's law is for queuing theory. It's a very, very simple law. It says the number of things that are in the queue or in flight equals the rate at which things arrive to the queue times the latency of the server pulling things out of the queue. So like if you're standing in line, you want to compute how many people are going to be standing in line. Just calculate, let's say you go to a movie theater and there's somebody taking, taking money for the tickets, right? 
If it takes them five, you know, two minutes to process a ticket, right, and people are arriving at say one every minute, you got a problem. But you can kind of compute the line depth. Rate times latency equals number in line. How does this apply to our processors? Well, I can invert it. So you can now see the form of a limiter equation again. Rate must be less than or equal to the number of things in flight that have a latency. So if a thread takes, for example, a thousand clock cycles to execute, right, that's a latency. So when, a, when you launch a thread block to when it exits, that's the latency of the thread block. If that's a thousand cycles, that's the L in the equation. Right, and so, for example, with warp count, I can have a maximum of 48 warps, N, so the rate is limited by that count. 48 warps divided by 1,000 clocks, your throughput's not going to be more than 48 over 1,000. It's another limiter. I can apply it to registers too. For example, if every register wants 16 registers, if every thread rather wants 16 registers, right, and I have 48, well I can't do that, but actually I can, uh, 48 warps, I have 48 warps times 16 registers, which is, you know, I can't do the math in my head. <laughs> It's uh, almost, yeah, somewhere. Um, yeah. So you have that many registers in flight, so to speak. And then I can look at the availability, and I can't exceed the availability. I have 1,000 registers. Well, that's okay. That limiter isn't hit. But you can see how you can apply the limiter equation, and it actually would get hit, where I simply run out of registers. I can't go faster than a certain rate because I don't have enough registers to do that. So the, comp the overall theory behind here is the combination of all these different limits sets your peak performance. Is limiter theory good? Well, we built limiter theory in our performance estimators, and then we found that in some cases it does not predict performance. It's, it's, it's um, aggressive, optimistic, and things slow down. And part of that, what we observed is there's traffic jam, what I'm calling traffic jam behavior. And all of us are familiar with this in our day-to-day -day experience, which is uh, picture you have an accident on the road. What happens when you have an accident on the freeway, right? You get this tremendous traffic jam behind the car that had, where the accident is, and you get basic open space in front of it. In other words, everything slows down, and there's this big munching up in front of the car accident, and then nothing's happening downstream. And that same behavior can occur in a processor, which is, you know, for example, we build a special function unit like doing log, and we only have one of them. And for some reason, you, you guys put in your program, log, 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 okay? So what happens is we hit that part of the program, and all of a sudden, there's all these log instructions want to go through this one little unit. And the unit says, well, I'm sorry, guys. I can only do one at a time, okay? So what ends up happening is we end up with a whole bunch of warps waiting behind the logarithmic unit, trying to get through it, and pretty much nothing, very little to do after the logarithmic unit. Right? In other words, if I can only get one thread per clock through the log unit, because there's only one of them, Right? Then I basically have to sort of funnel 32 threads from a warp into this one unit. Chink, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk, ka chunk. 32 clocks later, one instruction from 32 threads makes it by the log unit. Now all of a sudden I have, you know, I've, my warp miraculously has gotten past this logarithmic unit, but I'm the only guy there. So everybody else, is sit, all the other warps are still sitting there waiting their turn through that choke point, and there's very little to do past the choke point. So we see this traffic jam behavior. If you're not careful, you'll get bitten by it. So every time you do a log, it will stall for 30 seconds? Not, well, the whole warp will stall. You're not, a thread is not gonna be, you're gonna be processing a thread. We have more than that, by the way, but I, I, it's a hypothetical. I'm just saying, I was trying to explain how the funneling problem occurs, right? You can make, say, the funnel four wide, right? Well, it takes eight clocks to get through a, f how, do, how long will it take 32 threads to get through a four wide funnel? Eight clocks, okay? Four threads at a time, ka-chunk, 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 right? So when we get to this instruction, there's only four of them instead of 32 of them. We have to funnel that warp through this one little spot. And it'll take a bunch of time. And so while we're doing that funneling, you're not gonna be doing anything else there. Right? And everybody else who wants to go to that throne will sort of sit in their log jam behind it. That's what I was trying to explain. So it's not so much they stall, it's more that 
you know, you can't squeeze, you know, we have 32 things incompressible. We can't com squeeze it through a four wide thing on one clock. That's a sequence of it. And you could ask, why didn't we put in 32? Money. Right? In other words, if you, you know, logarithmic units are not cheap. Right? So if we put in a lot of them and then you didn't use them, you'd complain, well, you guys, you put in all this stuff and I'm not using it most of the time. This is back to, remember we said, there's demand versus supply. If we oversupply something, you know, it's, it's idle. So we kind of tailor things to say, we look at different programs and we say, well, some people want us to put more of one unit in the other. And there's kind of every program is different. In other words, the distribution of workload that we see from one program to the next is not the same. And we try and tailor it, find a where everybody can kind of agree. So like I said, you have to pay very close attention to this kernel mix. As I said before, all units equally critical. Don't traffic jam your thing. In other words, making thread blocks so large that only a few can execute is you've effectively traffic, you're increasing the likelihood of traffic jam. Because remember, if you create one really humongous thread block, I'm only going to put one of them on the SM because you made it huge. Okay? And so what happens now is the program counters for all those threads start off at the same place and they're all going to be trying to execute the same instruction at the same time. So you end up with this instruction, if it, you finally sequence it through and you get to the log, well, there's only one thread block to choose from, and I've got to funnel all those threads through that, through that log, and you'll slow down. So you're, the, the bigger you make the thread block, the more likelihood of, of, log jam, of these traffic jamming that you'll get. If you make the thread blocks very small, they'll all be doing different things at the same time, you reduce the likelihood of a, of a, a freeway jam. Give the SM more to choose from. And it really comes down to, you've got to think that you know, when we have this constrained resource, this is where the problem occurs. And, and finally, focus on resource consumption. You know, you really only want to use as few resources as necessary to load the SM. Which means, when you talk about this critical rate, what you care about, what you should care about as programmers for performance is loading the bandwidth resources. Not the space resources, the bandwidth resources. This means if we have 512 floating point operations per clock, you want to use that if you can. If you need it, use it. We can load um, basically 32 times 16, 512 loads per clock. Use it. Those are bandwidth resources. Space resources are not so important. A couple more slides. Uh, hiding load latency. So a, a really big difference in GPUs between CPUs is we really don't care about latency as much. Really don't. And the way we do that is with threads. This is Little's law again in application. Number of flight, arrival rate, latency. So you can picture I have a warp that's doing a load. And so I have a program of load and I can calculate what, for a certain throughput of the program, I calculate how fast will loads arrive. And we can say, for example, let's say I can do one load per clock. If memory latency is 100 clocks, if memory is 100 clocks away, how many loads will be going at one time? Well, it's Little's Law. It's very simple. One load arriving per clock, one memory latency is L is 100 clocks. There are going to be 100 parallel loads all going at the same time in various stages of execution. And shown here in this diagram. So I initiate the load request at one time, and then the data comes back 100 clocks later. And meanwhile, I keep doing that in that waterfall. I keep issuing loads. And eventually, you get to the point where the responses and the requests are in parallel. So now the load unit is completely busy all the time. That's what you want. Low latencies in these GPUs can get very, very large. If you're going all the way out to main memory and there's lots of competition, meaning, you've, you know, remember I talked about how we have 16 SMs. Every SM has 48 warps times 32. So 16, 48, 32. So about 15,000. Okay, so there can be 15,000 competitors sitting on this GPU. All trying, if they all do a load at the same time, that's one big funnel, right, trying to go to memory. So what ends up happening is we're going we're gonna to create this queuing, this server here, this queuing system, and we're going to start sequencing it through memory. 
And latencies can grow up pretty rapidly. You can see multi-hundred clock latencies. And you have to somehow hide that with your threads. So you can use threads to cover those latencies. How do you get less threads? Well, this is an example of how to program for less threads. And the concept is called batching. And so we want to group independent loads together. So for example, a pro I can show an example in this C code over here. What I have is I have a pointer to a block A, a pointer to a block B, and a pointer to a block C. If I do load, 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 notice that the second load doesn't need the result of A. It's not, in other words, if I look at these three loads, one, two, three, nothing of the first load affects the second load that affects the third load. They're all independent and parallel. Which means when I get to one thread, that one thread can do load, 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 and it won't block, even though the first load isn't gonna, is gonna take, say, several hundred clocks to, the actual write to A may take a, several hundred clocks. In other words, when, you, when the thread says, give me data, when it, you, give it DA under, you give it the pointer underscore D underscore A, and you tell the load unit, please give me the data. And it'll say, okay. Several hundred clocks later, the data actually shows up. If you weren't careful, right, I can show you an example how you can screw this up. If I said, go get A, go get B, then I'll do the multiply. Right? In theory, you could code it that way, right? A times B. Put the result into a temp, and then do the load for C. I reorganize the code a little bit. Do I have a, is there, no. Um, so, is what you're saying is we want to load as, as early ahead of when we need it? If we're writing back like a block of code, it's, it's in the best interest to put the load as early on as possible before you actually need it to give as much time for Most of the time, yeah. They call it load hoisting. So, you're moving the loads from down below up higher. You're hoisting it up. What's wrong with hoisting? Okay. Hoisting takes space. How hard is it to make the compiler do something like this? Compilers will generally try and do load hoisting. They can detect it. Some compilers are better at it than others. MVCC does it? Yes. The issue is you as a programmer can do transformations which you know would be unsafe for the compiler to do and you can hoist further. This one is obvious. We can find the non-obvious ones. Yes. The non-obvious ones will occur if you actually do, you have a store in there somewhere. Okay, in other words, you store the memory instead of loading from memory. With the compiler, when the compiler sees a store, it says, hmm, two different pointers, I don't know the pointer values, I can't assume that I can move the load ahead of the store. You, the programmer, may say, yeah, oh yeah, it's safe. They never point at the same thing. And this one is talking about fewer threads, but most of the time we want more threads, I'm confused. You're going to sometimes run out, right? In other words, you, you have to cover enough latency and all that. Remember, I talked about how you want to have smaller thread blocks, right? If I have... If I have to cover, for example, 500 clocks of latency, you measure that on the GPU because of the competition rates, right? Well, how many threads do you need to cover 500 clocks of latency if you're only doing one thread per clock? 500, right? So it's, it's you know, 500 threads is one third of the SM capacity. That's assuming you have a small number of registers. It could be as much as half the capacity, right? So you'd end up with two thread blocks running at the same time. It's not going to give the SM a lot of variance, variability to choose from in scheduling. So if you want to make the thread block smaller, instead of 500 threads, I want to make them 100 threads, a quarter of the size. Well now, I've, in order to cover 500 clocks worth of latency, I have to have four loads in parallel per thread. Right? So in other words, because it's that divide by B, right? The batch size is four, where if you got rid of, delete the word B there you see on the screen, well, Lambda, 1, latency 500, n equal 500. Now I batch. I do a four size batch. The, the numerator doesn't change. Denominator divided by four, one quarter of the number of threads to cover the same latency. So now my thread block is smaller. I can fit more of them on the GPU at the same time. Yeah, well, I think it's at least those two dimensions. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's a whole lot more. I, I think the constraint here, you can see that what, what's wrong with hoisting, like we did here. Well, I'm going to do A times B, and I don't really need C, 
I'm doing the A times B operation, I didn't need C. I could have waited till I finished A times B before I asked for C. So the problem in this particular case is I actually added storage. You have to put C somewhere. So it's back to that, you know, if you're, sp if you're space constrained, meaning going back to limiter theory, you said, well, I'm really hurting on registers, okay? I'm running out of registers. It's the most critical resource I have are register counts. So this would be a bad idea in that situation because you're, you're increasing the pressure on registers. At some point, there's only so much memory local to the processor, right? You know, you, you could write a program where you're going to exhaust it. It's not hard to do. So final thoughts, I guess, you know, back to things to focus on. Threads are free, and a common mistake I think I've seen is you tend to have kernels do too much. It's a lot better to write them short and sweet. Um, and you have to also keep in, in account that there are lots of threads, I mean, 15,000 in a Fermi at one time. So they're pretty cheap. They can be created really fast. Don't be shy using them. Keep, keep what they do short and sweet. Another thing I, I, I talk about is you really want to have them balanced, which I put the word there, which really means you don't want one thread taking 10 instructions and another thread taking 100 instructions in the same warp. It's a bad idea because we're going to force them to all exit at the same time. So you'll end up with ten, one warp doing nothing, part of it, all, for a long time. So you really want to keep what the threads do similar. Barriers are cheap. It's only a single instruction in the SM. It's, it's usually a good idea to keep threads with their behavior coherent. All should be doing the same thing at the same time. The machine will work a lot better in that mode. Final mistake you can make. Um, I've talked to a, num a number of people programming things when I go to different universities and I talk about how the algorithms and how they can make them run fast. And I, I could boil down to one sentence, partition arm results, not sources. And what I mean by that is, you want to associate threads with where they're going to write, not with where they're reading from. Okay, so yeah, let me give you an example of how you could use this in physics. Uh, I can either represent things as, let's say I'm, I'm looking at electrical forces between atoms, right? And you could say in space, you can use superposition, and you can say, uh, every point, the electric field, every point in space is the superposition of the, the, the contributions of the atoms that are floating out in space, right? So I can create a grid, and I can say memory is associated with, I have this memory array, a two-dimensional array, which is points in space that have the charge, the field at that point in space. And what I can do is I have another data structure that represents the atoms and the positions of the atoms, and I can iterate over the atoms and say, this atom in some inverse square distance from the atom is contributing this field to this point in space. I've just partitioned on sources, which means I've iterated across the atoms. I've partitioned my threads, one thread per atom. And what I've done is I've created this collision point in memory, which is trying to update the spot that represents the space, the field at that point. In other words, different atoms will try and contribute to the same spot, and I'll have this thing where I have to now order the writes that are going to that position. In other words, you're doing a superposition, which is read, add some value to it, store it back. I could have done things partitioned on destinations, which is I associate a thread with every point in space. And now I ask the question, which atoms are around me that want to contribute to that? I invert the problem. Now I've partitioned on results, which means I associate the threads with where the data is going to go, not with where the data is coming from. And now I don't have any conflicts, because one thread is only a, only one thread is actually allowed to write to one's position in space, and there'll never be a conflict, because I'm the only writer. I can think, if you personify this and think, I'm a thread, eee, happy, okay? I'm writing to one's, I, I'm not competing with anybody. I'm the only one allowed to write to that memory location. So I don't have to synchronize. There's nobody to talk to, right? If I, if I coded the problem, problem wrong, and I said associate threads with the atoms, I've now created a situation where all these atoms got to interact with each other to decide who's going to write the data first. And now I have this massive synchronization problem. So again, tend to, you should tend to think, associate threads with where it's going to be written, not where there's 
where it's going to be red. We can have read conflicts all over the place and we'll be very happy solving them for you. Where it's two different threads want to read from the same spot, no problem. We have hardware there that'll do that fan out at high speed. No hardware in the world will, will solve the conflict, the right conflict problem. So again, you have to think carefully when you're building these algorithms. Like I said, the last sentence, partition results, not on sources. I like to think of CUDA programs like that in terms of I associate threads with results and then I have barriers to go between phases. Producer, consumer. So you can think of it as the producer does, you have some code that's going to write results into some spot, sync threads, now read from that spot. And I don't have to do any synchronization between the two sides of the code because the barrier sync is going to do it for me. Things go really fast that way. Any questions on that? Or? I'll, just, I'll just make a quick note that usually in the literature, this is what's called a gather versus a scatter. And you guys have had some exposure to it um, in doing scatters in the last project. So some of the bugs that people have encountered is because they used scatters, which would scatter to the same element in the outgoing array, which is exactly this problem. Versus if you flip the whole problem into a gather, then you partition on the resulting array and thus gather data from um, all the things that contribute to that element um, versus scatter where you know what um, value something, uh, a source will write to. So it's kind of the two flip sides of the problem. And you would like to try and always do gathers, but it's not always easy to do that. Yeah, there was a while ago, I was, I, I, you guys are all math, I heard you're from mathematicians or back, background, so you probably know better than I do. But I, well, all, eons ago, I, when I was school, undergrad, I think they were talking about Lagrange versus Euclidean points of view, and somebody described to me this mathematician guy said, you know, uh, the wit, you know, grid problems, which is, you know, we have a boat floating down the river. Are you standing on the bank observing the boat, or are you in the boat observing the bank? Right. It's the same idea. Right. Two different ways of solving that problem. They both get the results done. One's a whole lot faster than the other. Well, that's it. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.